This is the current censored 2011 book, which over 15 universities now and hundreds of students and faculty participate in doing the research for each year. So if there are faculty or uh, students here that would like to be involved, it's a very easy process to become involved in Project Censored today. Um, our biggest output is our website. We do an annual book, which is a nice thing to do because we sell books and it keeps pace for the website. And, but our view, now on this website, we are getting 400,000 unique views a month. So we're in the top 10% of the websites in the world. Um, and we're posting news stories from universities all over the world on a regular basis. We have a blog where there's writers. We're always inviting new writers to come in and, and post. We have a daily news service. Those are the, the websites over on the right-hand side of the page where we feed news services from Al Jazeera English, um, from <clears throat> BBC, from independent sources of Christian Science Monitor that we trust, sources we trust from all over the world. And so we start our students there. They read independent media. Then they evaluate stories in cooperation with faculty members. Uh, and then they'll search those stories, and, then we'll, and they'll write a summary of them and post them on the website. So we call this validated news. And we're, you know, the goal is to have hundreds of universities and thousands of students validating news in the world that's done from the bottom up, that's the news of the people, where there's independent journalists from all over, and it's not the corporate media. Because we're living in a time now where the neoliberal forces of capital privatization, including the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the central banks, represent a transnational corporate class of very powerful people who are seeking nothing less than the complete control and domination of working people and their children worldwide. The US, NATO, military industrial media complex is an empire. And this, this NATO US military group is the police force in support of the transnational corporate class, the upper 1% of the people in the world that control the central banks and control the transnational corporations. The US NATO wars of aggression and occupation seek to achieve not only vast control of the resources in the world, but through psychological tactics of shock and awe, seek to achieve a paralysis of fear embedded in a hyper-real entertainment environment. Corporate media stands willing to propagandize humans into a state of inaction and fear. This propaganda reaches into the very depths of our psychological selves and the minds of our children. The root of these problems lie within democracy, the controlling of public information and education and access to it. Thomas Jefferson once wrote that where the press is free, every person is able to read all is safe, but we are no longer safe. For 35 years, Project Censored has, has produced validated independent news. That's what our books represent, that's what our website represents. Professors and students document the important stories the corporate mainstream fails to cover. In the beginning, Project Censored issued an annual press release citing the undercover censored news stories, which was widely covered in the independent press, alternative press in the United States and around the world. We still, we still get coverage. The, those, our stories are translated into every language in Europe. Um, they're in independent media all over, all over the world. But increasingly, it's the online research work that's being done. So all of our stories, since for the last 35 years, are posted on our site. It's a searchable site. When you search on the, on the Google inside the site, it hits all of our websites, all of our blogs, all of our content. And you, you'll find a great deal, of, students can find a great deal of information on a variety of subjects that is not normally out there. 
The project was founded by Dr. Carl Jensen in 1976. I took the project over um, 20 years after he founded it in 1996 and turned the project over to Mickey Huff, who's a professor of history at Diablo Valley College in, in California, and is, he is now the director of Project Censored. So his book, with his name on it, will be coming out. Last year's book had both of our names on it, and this year it's his book alone. But the process is quite wide. I mean, there's, we had contributions from Spain, from the Canary Islands, from Chile, from Argentina, from Ecuador, uh, from Germany, from universities in Canada and around the US, uh, contributing stories to this year's list of stories that we're currently working on. Now, as corporate media global, is globalizing, research and analysis of these media failures that are ongoing, we must globalize as well to be under, understand and to deal with a corporatized, globalized media. Project Censored believes that the corporate media is increasingly irrelevant to democracy and working people in the world. We need to tell our own stories from the bottom up. At Project Censored Media Freedom Foundation, which is our parent organization, we examine the coverage of news and information important to the maintenance of healthy and functioning democracy. We define modern media censorship as a subtle, yet constant and sophisticated manipulation of reality in our mass media outlets. Such media manipulation takes the form from political pressures, government officials, economic pressures from advertisers and funders, and legal pressures from lawsuits and deep-pocketed individuals, who, and direct, deliberate misinformation by the corporate media. As political scientist and former Project Censored National Judge Dr. Michael Parenti explained in his article, Media Monopoly Manipulation, censorship involves framing, false balancing, attacking and labeling, preemptive assumptions, follow-up avoidance on questioning, sliding of context, and many, many fallacies such as the use of red herring, straw person, and appealing to emotions. Therefore, censorship is often a matter of degree, and any degree can, it re can result in a distortion of any topic or story. The end result could be confusion, arriving at a non-factually supported conclusions, or lacking a total understanding of, of the story in itself. It is for this reason that censorship is a key element of any propaganda system <clears throat> and is antithetical to the goals of a free press. The media today consists of, the corporate media today consists of primarily 10 major corporations interlocked with business and the policy elites in the United States and the world. They have about 120 members on their board of directors. <clears throat> this is actually a very small number of people. And they, they in turn, these boards of directors, they in turn sit on 20% of the corporate 1,000 in the United States. So they are on the banks. They're on the military contractors, they're the insurance companies, the health companies. They are corporate America. They are the transnational corporate class of the world. <clears throat> this is news top down, news filled with propaganda, misinformation, designed primarily to entertain and not to inform. Corporate media has completely abdicated their responsibility to the First Amendment in the United States, and they give new life to the late Neil Postman's famous description of America as the best entertained, least informed society in the world. Since 9-11-2001, the public relations industry has experienced phenomenal growth. There are three largely publicly traded mega corporations, Omnicom, WPP, and the Interpublic Group. Together, these firms employ over 160,000 people in 170 countries. Not only do these monstrous firms have control a massive amount of wealth, they possess a network of connections in powerful international institutions with direct connections to government, multinational corporations, and the global dominance group of policymaking bodies uh, in the world. Public relation firms create news stories, and the corporate media access them as if, as if they were valid. These are, these are stories created by public relation firms. 
WPP, a UK-based conglomerate, touts an impressive list of subsidiaries such as Young and Rubicon, Burston Marcellers, Ogilvy and, and Mather Worldwide, Helen Nol Knowlton, and along with numerous other PR advertising and crisis management firms. Now, Helen Knowlton, they helped create a national outrage at the beginning of the first Iraq war by creating a horrifying event that was perpetu per perpetuated by Iraq soldiers in Kuwait. A young woman named Nayira claimed in front of the US Congress that she had witnessed Iraq soldiers come into the Kuwaiti hospital with guns and then go to the room where the 15 babies were in the incubators. They took the babies out of the incubators and left them on the floor to die. And she's crying as she gives this testimony. The public was not told that Nayira was nowhere near Kuwait at that time, that she was the daughter of the ambassador at the US, and they weren't told that her performance was, was trained and practiced by Helen Knowlton and coordinated by the White House. So this was deliberate lying. And, but once these stories have been told, once this information comes out, reversing that or even explaining years later that this was a lie, it's already done the damage and already created the excitement of going to war that it was meant to do. In the early 1990s, Chris Hedges covered the Gulf War for the New York Times. Ten years later, he wrote, the notion that the press was used in the war is incorrect. The press wanted to be used. They saw itself as part of the war effort. Truth-telling independence was far from the media and agenda. The press was eager to be of service to the state during the war, um, and most, was, most everyone else was as well. So it's, it's a patriotic propaganda process, starting with our top corporations that continue. Now, Ed Herman and Noam Chomsky, in their book Manufacturing Consent, published some 22 years ago now, claim that because media is firmly embedded in the market system, that it reflects the class values and concerns of its owners and advertisers. According to Herman and Chomsky, the propaganda model of media uh, has these five systematic filters of corporate class bias, concentrated private ownership, a strict bottom line of profit or orientation, over-reliance on government and corporate sources from news, a primary tendency to avoid offending the powerful, and an almost religious worship of the market economy, strongly opposing any alternative beliefs. These filters limit not only what becomes news in society, they set parameters on acceptable coverage of daily events. Now, however, media consolidation and the expansion of public relations firms inside the news systems in the world today has resulted in a far more deliberate form of censorship than the propaganda model talked about 22 years ago. The corporate media is deeply in interlocked with the military industrial complex and the global dominance policy elites in the US, Europe, Japan, transnational corporate class. The, the media is increasingly dependent on various government and corporate sources of news. Maintenance of a continuous news show requires constant feeds, ever-changing uh, supply of stimulating events, breaking news bits, 24-hour news shows, MSNBC, Fox, CNN, have constant contact with the White House, the Pentagon, and the public relations firms representing government and the corporations. Simply put, censorship is more blatant and, and outright than ever. We face what appears to be a military industrial media empire so powerful and so complex that truth is mostly absent and or report, reported in disconnected segments with little historical context. A case in point, the London Times reported in June of last year that American troops are now operating in 75 nations around the world. Obama secretly has sanctioned a, a huge increase in the number of US Special Forces carrying out search and destroy missions against Al Qaeda and other locations. This is an increase far in excess of the Special Forces used under the Bush administration and reflects how aggressively Obama is pursuing al-Qaeda beyond his public rhetoric of global engagement and diplomacy. Somehow this information didn't make it into the US media. Managed news includes the, re the release of specific stories intended to, to build public support as well as the deliberate non-coverage of news stories 
that may undermine U.S. goals? Have you been told about the continuing privatization of the war? Independent journalist Jeremy Scahill wrote in The Nation in 2009 how Blackwater, now known as Z, they have 30 subsidiary corporations. Um, they, now, they operate in, in Karachi, in Pakistan, and they gather intelligence to direct the U.S. military drone attacks on that country. I have no doubt that they had some implementations in, in, in the assassination of Osama bin Laden. Um, we, have a, we have as many private military operations people in Afghanistan and Iraq as we have soldiers. These are private armies, private wars, corporate wars, and encouraged and maintained by a corporatocracy of the, in the world. Moreover, there's been little coverage of how global research um, in 2010 covered the U.S. capabilities for cyber warfare, as announced by the Secretary of Defense Robert Gates when they activated the Pentagon's first computer command on the world's first comprehensive multi-service military cyber operation. Cybercom is based at Fort Meade, Maryland, and is home to the National Security Agency. So the internet has been penetrated by the military in a very real way. Now, only 5% of the people under 25 read a daily newspaper. So they're online. Some don't get any news on any given day. They get their news from corporate television, increasingly from the internet. The U.S. National Security Services know this, and they are increasingly focusing on deception and propaganda on the Internet itself. The military is developing software that it will let it secretly manipulate social media using fake online personas designated to influence Internet conversations and spread American propaganda. Nick Fildy and Ian Cobain reported on Common Dreams in March that a California corporation has been awarded a contract with the U.S. Central Command, CENTCOM, to develop what it describes as online persona management systems. They will allow a service person to control up to 10 separate identities at the same time. CENTCOM Commander Bill Speaks said the technology supports classified blogging activities in foreign language websites to enable Centron to counter violent extremists and enemy propaganda outside the U.S. So we're creating false people on the internet, targeting uh, places around the world. But once this software is developed, and US personnel are working around the clock in one location to respond to emerging online conversations, a host of blog, blog posts, tweets, retweets, chat room posts, and other interventions, details of this contract, you know, we, just, we, we don't know the depth of it. These interventions uh, you know, are, are, can be in English, but they're also in Arabic, Farsi, Urdu, other, other languages. Now, according to CENTCOM, U.S. military was not going to do this in, inside the U.S. This would be illegal. But this brings back the, the idea of Echelon, which we covered 15 years ago. And Echelon was a spy satellite system that monitored all the communication, electronic communications in the world that was in partnership between New Zealand, Canada, Australia, Great Britain, and the US, and monitoring worldwide communications. So the CIA doesn't, but doesn't need to spy on the American people's communications, but the Canadians and the British will give them the information, and that's OK. So uh, creating false personas on the internet is, is very likely to end up being the same thing once the software is developed. Among the most important censored stories of the past decade, has to be that the number of civilian casualties that, has, that occurred during the Iraq War. Um, this, of course, did not cover the, the deaths in the first Gulf War or the combinations thereof, but we now know that in excess of one million people have died in Iraq since we invaded that country. And the British polling group, Opinion Business Research, reported a survey done in the late 2007 where they interviewed 2,400 families randomly selected throughout the country, asking the question, has anyone in your family died from war violence? And their range at that time was 800,000 to a million two. That was their general range that they estimated for the entire population. Uh, so they said at that point that it was unlikely a million. Now this, this study came on the heels of two other studies by um, John Hopkins University, one done in 2003, which set the civilian deaths at that time at 100,000, 
and a second study done in 2006, which set the civilian deaths at 650,000 at that time. So over a million people, we now have the survey data, have died because we invaded, invaded that country. Now, the magnitude of this, these deaths are undeniable. Millions more have been wounded physically. Five million people have been displaced from their homes. Uh, the continued occupation by U.S. guarantees a monthly death rate in the thousands. We've dropped more tons of bombs on Iraq than all of World War II combined. Uh, we've left a depleted uranium trail there that now one out of three children born in Fallujah has a birth defect. Um, horrendous damage, absolutely horrendous damage. Um, and the John Hopkins survey said that clearly half of these people were killed by U.S. military forces, aerial bombing and firefights in cities. So this isn't just Iraqis blowing up Iraqis, which is what we often see in the media, a bomb went off here, you know, a, a Shiite village was attacked here. This is massive destruction of human life, families, and permanent damage to millions and millions of people. But you wouldn't know it from AP or the U.S corporate media. AP, which reach, reaches over a billion people in the world in 2009, when this figure first came out, the million figure, and had been verified by MIT. MIT took a look at the, the process. They said, yep, we looked at the statistics, million dead Iraqis. I mean, it was, there was no question. It was in the Nation magazine in 2009. AP comes out with a statement in April 23rd, 2009. Previously undisclosed Iraq government tally obtained by the Associated Press showed that 87,000 Iraqis have been killed in violence since 2005 and about 110,000 since the beginning of the war. The figure is based on government tallies, counts of casualties from earlier years in hospitals and media reports. Um, the government officials shared the Iraq tally in condition of being anonymous, saying that they, providing the statement that they are the most authoritative counting to date of the war is told. Now that story ran in April of 2009. It ran again on July 25th in 2009, and again on October 14th in 2009, so literally every paper in the country ran it. Whereas the million figure, you won't find that anywhere. It's not in the corporate media, it's not talked about. The human cost of war is ignored in this country, and, or in, in the world, literally. <clears throat> Now, what really turned, turned us around at Project Censored in the mid-90s was what we started to see, deliberate lies and manipulations. And, and I mean, this has always been there, but to, to see it overtly, deliberately, what was starting to realize that, yes, this is where we came up with the terminology, managed news. News is managed. And on October 2, 25, 2005, the American Civil Liberties Union had posted to their website copies of 44 autopsy reports acquired from the American military sources that covered the deaths of civilians who died in Iraq and Afghanistan in 2002 to 2004. Now, these were civilians who died in prisons while in U.S. custody. And their, their bodies were examined by U.S. medical doctors, and the autopsy reports were publicly available after ACLU threatened to sue. Um, and there was a lot of pressure. They didn't want to release these things, but finally they did. So they posted these 44 autopsy reports on the ACLU website in, two, in the fall of 2005. 23 of these reports said the cause of death was homicide. The people were murdered while in custody. I mean, there was no question about it. Conditions of the bodies indicate extreme torture, broken bones, strangulation, asphyxiation, bruises, extensive body damage. You can still, they're still on the website, you can still read them. And the balance of those, those 44 autopsy reports, uh, the cause of death was primarily listed as heart failure while being extensively tortured. So here we had, and this is in 2005, absolute proof that we were torturing people to death. AP puts out a story. It goes out to all 1,700 dailies in the United States. 
It goes out to all national radio and television programs, all 5,000 of them. And a thorough transcript checks with Nexus, Lexus, ProQuest Library showed that over 99% of the, 99.5% of the newspapers in the country did not pick up that story. They just ignored it. 12 newspapers that we could find covered it. Some, like the Seattle paper, buried it in a bigger story about Iraq that day. The LA Times had it on page A4. There were some Midwest papers that carried it. But for some reason, 99 out of 100 editors in these daily newspapers around the country decided that wasn't a story the American people needed to see. Or maybe this was too contradictory to our perceived values of who Americans are. Whatever the reasons, it didn't, it didn't fly. And it's never been mentioned again in any corporate media, ever. So we believe that this is pretty deliberate. The fact that Afghans, civilians, are in one of the deadliest periods right now. Uh, 2,400 civilians killed for sure last year. 3,200 wounded. Six to seven non-combatants killed every day. These wars of occupation, these 9-11 wars, the people dying are 90% civilians. They're not wars between insurgents and occupying forces. They are. But most of the people dying are, are families, children, people in the wrong place at the wrong time. And hundreds of thousands are affected in various ways by violence, forced to leave their homes, deprived of health care, education, livelihoods, opportunities, refugees. And in Pakistan now, an, a, an investigation by the Campaign for Innocent Victims in Conflict, called CIVIC, last October, reviewed 139 drone strikes since the beginning of 2009, found that a total of 30 civilians had been killed in, in nine of those strikes, 14 women and children. That's 3.3 civilians for each drone strike. In addition to the report's finding on civilian casualties, there's, there's no government or military mechanism that investigates or collects data on civilian casualties. So we're flying these drones around. We have no record of who's killed, what the damage is, and there just simply aren't corporate media people out in the villages counting bodies. There's a big mislabeling of militants. A militant group was attacked here by a drone and 30 militants were killed yesterday or the day before or the day before that. U.S. drone strikes paints a very different picture than the realities of civilian deaths and increased anti-American sentiment that results. Now, there's so many stories that happen each year that the corporate media doesn't cover that we, we've, we've always had this list of stories, you know, 25 stories, the main stories the corporate media didn't cover. But in, in, in a sense, we've, we've come to realize that this is a drop in the bucket. That there's massive lying, massive information, and there's whole clusters of subjects that the corporate media won't cover, or if they cover, it's just little bits of it, and it's out of context. So we call these censored news clusters. In our book in 2012, we'll have 25 stories, but they will be centered around dozens of other stories that feed into this cluster of censorship by the corporate media. And certainly the cost of war and violence is one of those. The cost of our returning soldiers from, from, from the battlefield, the fact that more military personnel committed suicide in 2010 than died in Afghanistan and Iraq. The fact that veterans coming back from these wars, psychologically damaged, are killing themselves at an average of 18 per day, which is a total since the beginning of the Iraq war of 50,000 veteran suicides 
in the United States. That's the cost of war. And now they're doing this big psychological program in the military to try to create soldiers who are, are desensitized to killing. So going in, it's a desens psychological process of desensitizing people to killing. And we do this with thousands and thousands of young men and women. And it often doesn't work. They often become very crippled, very hurt. And the damages that they're doing to the civilians in these areas. And we know of the German photographs from two months ago of the, of the glee shown in the faces of the young men who had just killed two, two young Afghan boys and they were holding their bodies up. And these pictures made, you know, the, made around the world, although we didn't see them very clearly here. And we see other clusters, clusters of economics and inequality. This is a whole area of food waste. In the, in the U.S., half the food is thrown away. And then we have hungry people. How, and the corruption that goes on, we have unemployment of one out of five people. Global poverty has doubled since 1970. Massive increase in poverty in the U.S. Global hunger has expanded. So we don't get these pictures in the corporate media. We say, oh, well, that's getting better. Or we're getting too many children and we can't feed them all. It, it, there's a whole different perspective. We have enough food to feed the world. We waste it. We sell it. We destroy it. And that is a cluster of misinformation. We have a huge environmental cluster and health cluster of misinformation about corporations and the damages and we have the, the, the Gulf War spell from BP and oh, it's all cleaned up, it's all gone away now, it's not so bad, you can eat the shrimp again, don't believe that. And all the oil has now settled in the bottom of the ocean, now the dolphins are dying and their babies aren't happy and there, there's no industry there, but it's all going to get better. And Obama approved deep drilling again after suspending it for six months. And BP's back in business doing the same thing. And they had a tax write-off because of it, so they didn't have to pay any taxes in the United States this year. Those stories we don't get. We don't get the stories about the, the abuses of power, government-sponsored technologies for weather modification, sweatshops in China making iPods, U.S. agencies trying to push GMO foods around the world. Um, special prisons for Muslim and Arabs in the U.S. The apocalypse in the Congo. There's so much that we don't get. So much that's not covered. That it becomes a broader issue for media activists to engage in to counter the misinformation, the false operations that are going on worldwide. <clears throat> I heard early today about fatty foods. Hundreds of millions of dollars are spent by corporations to market fatty foods to children. We have obese children. Um, Robert Wood Johnson spends $100 billion a year from their foundation to try to stop childhood obesity when they're facing an industry that spends $1.4 billion to try to get kids to eat fat food. There's something wrong here. There's something seriously wrong. Parents of teens are, in, in the U.S. are seldom aware that their children are increasingly at risk of being systematically targeted and manipulated by recruitment officers and psychologically remodeling for the war machine. Military planners hungry for new recruits commission psychological research and carefully read neuropsychiatric literature and how it pertains to adolescent behavior and adolescent minds. And then they apply this research to their recruitment efforts to get these young vulnerable teens to sign up. Six out of ten of the people in the military joined when they were a teenager. When they were a teenager. As the 9 wars, 11 wars continue and the number of dead and disabled and young people climb, civilian doubts about the purpose, the direction has grown even harder to recruit these young people. As a, as a result, convincing new potential recruits to enlist has become increasingly difficult. The Pentagon addresses this recruitment by spending thousands, thousands of mil the dollars, millions of dollars, 
on our tax programs, from our tax programs, designed to deceive, seduce, and to capture our youth. Military recruiters have been granted full access to children, all the, all the schools and their homes or wherever they can be tracked. We've, the Pentagon has invaded our movies, our television, our minds, and invite our children to play violent and damaging video games and emotionally charged material designed to manipulate and reformat them into replacement soldiers. Recent Pentagon research revealed the desire and intention to enlist as highest among young recruits. Subterfuge is employed to guide teens toward recruiter offices. Example of this is the U.S. <clears throat> Army sponsors a website called Cyber Mission. It offers web-assisted science, math, and technology competition for 11, 12, and 13-year-olds and the services of online military personnel, direct contact with a military person. Since 2002, the Pentagon has developed a massive teen database gleaned from private sources and records obtained via the No Child Left Behind Act. This information is filed in joint advertising and market and research studies. A giant Pentagon-run privately subcontracted XFAX database contained contact and information data on 30 million children between 16 and 25 years of age. During adolescence, changes in brain structure, the characteristic of behavior that age, teens are actively recruited to the military. If your 16-year-old has a cell phone, the military knows it. The techniques employed by military recruiters are directly targeted to the functional brain development characteristics of the adolescent. Targeting is purposeful. The Bush administration wrote in silent, signed in the Child, No Child Left Behind Act, Section 9528 is a provision enabling military recruiters to access high school student records, to access the students themselves as they attend high school campuses throughout the country. Students, their parents are offered a choice to opt out if they know about it and most actively, get, and they have to engage and do something, um, then the military can simply go in. A promise is a promise unless it's made by a military recruiter. After a recruit has promised the moon, they're asked to sign on the allotted line, and they miss the fine print. The fine print says, laws and regulations that govern military personnel may change without notice to you. Such changes may affect your status, pay, allowances, benefits, and responsibilities as members of the United States Armed Forces, regardless of the provisions of this enlistment, re-enlistment document. So you become under, you're no longer under constitutional law, you're under military justice law. In other words, recruits are promised and training assignments, lofty jobs, all of that. Despite any oral or written promise, the recruit is serving under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Other statements, assurances, or promises otherwise do not apply. Families are pushed, a bit against, pushed back against the slogans, be all you can be in the army of one, but potential recruits receiving increasingly say no to joining up. Military planners move to new people in command chairs, ramp up their efforts, craft new slogans, fly Black Hawk helicopters onto high school and, and campuses bring children as young as six and eight years of age to see them. They get a free football. All part of the marketing plan of, of the military. The role of universities in supporting public education, and I should add high schools here as well, is receiving new attention. There's a number of various social science disciplines being more receptive to what we call action research, liberation sociology, applied anthropology, comparative historical analysis, community service involvement, experiential learning. The organization Sociologists Without Borders is one example of these efforts. Certainly some aspects of these research styles have at their base an understanding and assumption that research being done is for human betterment and democracy building rather than just theory or research or getting your name printed. And exactly these efforts that the social sciences that threaten the power elites inside the business roundtables, the Trilateral Commission, the boardrooms of America. C. Wright Mills, his book The Power Elite, William Domhoff, Who Rules America, he has a new edition this year. Challenges to policy elites combine the social movements of the 60s 
have led to a decline of top-level support for widespread college education. Thousands of elites since the 60s have pursued strategies of reduced support for what they see as non-essential disciplines, college-level training for the masses. We're now witnessing a reversal of university opportunities for students in the U.S. with public education cuts in, in over half the states. And in the fall of 2011, 200,000 college-eligible students will not be able to get into college in the state of California. Elites encourage campus administrators to use no child left behind styles of measurement, such as test scores and time to degree outcomes, to decide priorities for funding. These assessments are based on private business stakeholder perceptions of the primary purpose of higher education being to create a willing, capable, and job ready labor force. Over the past year, food prices around the world have shot up sharply surpassing the previous purge in 2007 and 8 surge. As measured by the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, in February the UN price indexes rose for the eighth consecutive month, the highest level since 1990. As a result, 2010 began, 44 million people were quietly crossed the threshold of malnutrition. 925 million are already there. If prices continue to rise, the food crisis will push the ranks of the hungry, of the, hungry the daily hungry, the malnutrition, to over a billion people. Another two billion suffer from hidden malnutrition of inadequate diets. These are the people, the three billion people who live on less than two dollars a day in the world. Deprivation will shorten lives, it will stunt their minds, it will, can, it will weaken their health. World poverty has doubled since 1970. And the amount of people living in extreme poverty increases by three million people per year. <clears throat> A global analysis of 80% of the people in, in the world are in areas where fresh water supply is either insecure or only seasonal. Lack of food, water, and increasing poverty is never discussed globally in the corporate media. There's a famine here, an unrest there, a problem in Africa somewhere, but the free market capitalism is always presented as the answer to these problems. That's the corporate media mantra. Capitalism will make it better. The question then becomes, how can this mass ignorance and this corporate media deception exists in the U.S. and around the world, and, and how, can we, how can we deal with that? Social scientists know that U.S. workers have been faced with a 35-year decline in real wages. The top few percent enjoyed unparalleled wealth. Increased tax burdens have widened the distribution gap. We know that the U.S. has the highest infant mortality rate among industrialized nations. We face factory closings, 20% unemployment, laid off teachers, and a multi-trillion dollar stratospheric national debt, 50 million without health care. Americans required, a, we must make a change of this. And corporate media, it's like going to Disneyland. If you're watching television news, it's like you're in Disneyland. You know you're really there, and you know it's not real. So the word, the hyper-reality, the word from Baudrillard, the hyper-reality becomes more meaningful when we study and we, when we take a look at what's happening in corporate media today and how it impacts people. Few people understand this primary frame in the medium alone, that there's an emotional content to the media. You want to hate the bishop who was just indicted for child porn. You want to despise the man who was on television today who'd killed his wife. You want to, you know, there's this emotional content. Oh, we got Osama bin Laden. And there's an excited delirium of, of celebration that went in some circles with that. An emotional content. So what we end up with from corporate media is that we, people, particularly those watching that media alone, become embedded in a state of excited delirium of knowinglessness. They don't know what's going on, but they're sure excited about what they're seeing. So that's a complete disinvestment of power. That's a disempowerment of people. And this is not an accident. This is deliberate. 
So investigative research, investigative journalism, colleges, universities, and high schools can ask the questions. Who are the beneficiaries of these inequalities? Who are these? We can investigate. Research identifies who are the deciders. It's rare that we get someone like George Bush to say, I'm the decider. However, we can examine and identify the individuals behind these decisions, behind this corporate media, behind these war machines of making profit off of these wars, behind these occupations, behind the transnational banks and the weaken of our economies. We can say who these people are, and we can have a different level of public awareness that pulls the covers off those behind these bureaucratic curtains and exposes the self-interest of the unweak, unequal rewards. That's more than just news. That's, that's investigative research. It's investigative journalism. It's investigation of power. Student-centered investigative research is a use of social science research methods to conduct data collection, analysis of social economic issues for broad public dissemination, much, in depth, much like in-depth investigative reporting, which we no longer see in corporate media. Colleges and universities and high schools are a place where valuable information from independent media can be released for public consumption. That's what we do. That's what we hope thousands of universities will do, thousands of classrooms around the world. Because we are one of the few places left where we can engage in these kinds of activities. Investigative research and journalism is democracy building that addresses the socioeconomic circumstances of who decides who wins and who loses in society. Public investigative research and social sciences ask the question, who are the people that are most powerful? Who makes the important decisions that affect their lives? How did these sociopolitical elites acquire their positions? And what advantages do they share? And what impacts do their advantages have over the rest of us? These are democratic questions in a very real way. As we continue to face a military industrial media complex so powerful and complex, the truth is mostly absent Barack Obama administration is consuming, continuing the neoconservative agenda of the U.S. military domination of the world, perhaps with a kinder, gentler face, but the Obama's election had a moment of hope for many. However, the new administration did not decrease military spending, it was not a reversal of the U.S. global dominance. Instead, Robert Gates was retained as Secretary of Defense, making Obama the first president ever to, from an opposing party in U.S. history to keep in place the outgoing administration's Secretary of Defense or war. Additionally, Obama expanded the war in Afghanistan, making minimal long-term reductions in Iraq, using drone attacks in multiple other countries, and of course, um, assassinating Osama bin Laden. But they were nice enough to wait till the royal wedding was over to carry out the assassination. So we have a truth emergency. And a truth emergency is a lack of purity in news brought by propaganda and distraction. is a state when, which people, despite potentially being in a wash to sea of information, lack the power of discernment, resulting in a knowinglessness about which, what, what is really going on in the world. In short, we live in a time where people do not know whom to trust for accurate information and yearn for the truth. Universities and colleges are, are diverse and complex. We have, our, we have our theoretical feuds and ongoing, but we have a we, have, we face a global empire of corporate military power that's unrelenting in its propagandizing. Um, we have perhaps a, colleges and universities, schools, the last semi-democratic open scholarship in institutions left. It falls on us to take a stand on truth and transparency by encouraging independent media and research regarding the manipulations of the powerful. We have a public education role and responsibilities for both training critical thinkers in society and expanding public knowledge and awareness of inconvenience truths. A common purpose for all of us to help us guide us in these endeavors, our website has hundreds and hundreds of posts. We have universities all over the world now engaged. We need more, a lot more. We'd love to see go from 400,000 hits a month to a million or more, that this become a source of information that people can trust. A commonality of our purpose, what we can agree on, 
are clearly principles espoused by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. This offers us a fundamental value statement for colleges, universities, high schools, and even grammar schools to openly share. And this is so undertaught. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, established in 1948, all the, cons all the countries in the UN at that time agreeing to this, these are the principles of what a human, human, human rights are, with institutions that can offer hope for people to unite and oppose the common aggressors manifested in militarist and unresponsive governments. Only when the public forms and controls its own information resources will it become armed with the, with the power that knowledge gives to create a new, truly vibrant democratic society that promises as well as delivers liberty, peace, and prosperity to all. Thank you.